will personally write you a campaign check now on behalf of this country, which does not want you to be president, but which badly wants you to run. Look, this has been a very dark week for a lot of people. The Supreme Court is about to lurch to the right for the foreseeable future. And if things seem hopeless right now, it's because, to be completely honest, they basically are. Amy Coney Barrett. Why is it that so many female judges have three names? Sandra Day O'Connor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Judge Penny Brown Reynolds? Judge Barrett's been on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals for only three years. In that time, she's authored a little bit over a hundred opinions. Unlike the U.S. Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals doesn't get to pick which cases to review. So a fair amount of her opinions deal with boring routine bullshit, like administrative agency law. Wow. Real exciting stuff. A lot of our recent conservative justices have been nothing but a disappointment. I think we have yet to see a true successor to Antonin Scalia emerge. Could Judge Barrett step into that role? Could she end the abomination of the fraudulent constitutional right to a zone of privacy? Well, I can't ascribe to her a full-fledged judicial philosophy at this point. She simply hasn't written enough. Instead, I intend to use this video as a little bit of a preview into how Judge Barrett might be as a judge. Like the video game previews that I read in magazines growing up, there's still a lot unknown. Things are subject to change. R1. Originalism and textualism. In my recent Scalia video, I explained that his philosophy was based around the complementary judicial philosophies of originalism and textualism. If you don't know what those things mean, then watch my Scalia video. I'm not about to serve up to the people some rotten leftovers from two weeks ago. Amy Coney Barrett has identified herself as a textualist. For example, we all know about President Trump releasing criminals early through the First Step Act. This has generated a ton of appeals from criminals arguing that they deserve to receive their early release. Luckily, the First Step Act doesn't apply to everyone. Judge Barrett has relied heavily on the text of the act when dealing with these appeals. She cites the dictionary definitions of words in her judicial opinions. The key to interpreting statues is the text of the statues themselves. Her opinions on the Constitution have also emphasized the importance of understanding the original meaning of words. You know, what these words meant back in 1776. This includes taking deep dives into American history. You may read the Constitution and think, what the fuck is an emolument? Well, you don't just make up some definition for it. You research that shit and you find out what it meant. R2, civic versus individual rights in the Second Amendment. Judge Barrett draws a distinction between what she describes as civic and individual rights. Civic rights entitle us to some control over our government. They include voting, the right to serve on a jury, running for office, auditioning for family feud. Individual rights, on the other hand, entitle us to some protections from the government. Things like free speech, due process, you know, libertarian shit. Judge Barrett believes that civic rights can constitutionally be subjected to virtue-based restrictions. Individual rights, though, cannot. They're universal and meant to apply to everyone even the unvirtuous. Our tradition has always been to ban felons from voting, running for office, or serving on a jury, except for Florida. Florida is degenerate. These things are civic rights. We can restrict them only to the virtuous. Now, everyone who is not a felon is a pretty low bar to set for virtuous. I mean, it includes people like Vosh. These days, it's the only standard we have left. After all, it used to be the case that only property-owning males in good standing had these civic rights. Theoretically, we could always reinstate virtue-based restrictions on these civic rights. It wouldn't be unconstitutional to do so. Sure, there's that whole 19th Amendment, but I'm sure we could find some loophole to bullshit around that one. Anyways, this distinction has rather significant implications for the Second Amendment. One of the most prolific crimes in our nation is felon in possession of a firearm. We all know that when you're convicted of a felony, you lose your right to possess guns. A repeat felon arrested after dropping a gun on the floor inside of a donut shop full of police officers. Judge Barrett says this is bullshit. The right to bear arms isn't a civic right. We can't restrict it only to the virtuous. So how did everything get so fucked up? 
In colonial America, if you were convicted of any felony, you were executed. Felony meant a type of offense of which the punishment was execution. In the 18th century after the founding, soybeans started to be exported to America. While correlation doesn't always equal causation, America stopped executing certain felons. For example, burglars were no longer routinely executed. Thus, the definition of felony changed from an offense of which the punishment would be execution to an offense where the punishment could be execution. In these cases where the court chose not to institute the death penalty, they would institute what was called the civic death sentence. A civic death sentence meant the felon forfeited the right to vote, serve on a jury, or run for office. Firearm rights didn't have any part in any of this. Because violent criminals were always executed, there wasn't really any need to restrict felons from possessing firearms. No point in banning a dead guy from possessing a gun. Over time, this historical context was lost. When we stopped executing violent criminals, it became important to restrict their ability to possess weapons. The right to possess a firearm became associated with the civic rights. If we can't categorically ban all felons from possessing firearms, well, what can we do? Clearly, we don't want certain people out have guns. Now, Judge Barrett does believe that people convicted of certain felonies like violent crimes or drug crimes can be constitutionally prohibited from possessing a gun. That's because it would be dangerous for someone who was violent or consuming drugs to possess a gun. Therefore, this type of ban would not constitute a virtue-based restriction. Instead, it's a public safety restriction that's imposed with due process on those convicted of particular felonies. Are three abortion and gender. Judge Barrett's never written an opinion on abortion. She has joined two opinions written by other judges discussing abortion issues. Neither of those opinions endorsed a full-blown reversal of Roe v. Wade. They did both, however, support restrictions on abortion. Now, I could speculate that Judge Barrett acted politically in these situations. She avoided writing opinions or taking controversial stances so that she could be a SCOTUS contender. I mean, who really knows though. That may just be wishful thinking on my part. I did find one abortion law where she joined the dissenting opinion in defense of that was interesting. The law required for funerals to be held for fetal remains. I wonder who would attend a funeral like this? Obviously the mother who aborted the child wouldn't. Would the father? The grandparents? Would us conservatives show up to mourn the child who never had a chance? It's kind of depressing to think about, to be honest. My hope is that someone who would join an opinion like this wouldn't let the bullshit that is Roe v. Wade continue. We're all supposed to be citizens of a democratic republic. Don't belittle us in the believing that the Constitution protects this. If we're told that the U.S. Constitution protects the right to an abortion, well, I can just as easily say that it protects the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of an unborn child. I can at least point to instances where the Founding Fathers used that specific language. Show me the Federalist paper where Thomas Jefferson talked about the right to an abortion. If the Constitution doesn't clearly prohibit something, it's meant to be left for the state. States to decide. The only other notable opinion by Judge Barrett on gender weighed in on this whole campus kangaroo court sexual assault proceedings. In a sex discrimination lawsuit against Purdue University filed by a man, Judge Barrett reversed a lower level decision granting summary judgment in favor of the university. Judge Barrett found a plausible inference that Purdue had discriminated against the plaintiff because he's a man. She noted the sexual assault allegation when compared to the plaintiff's response was nothing but a he said, she said situation. The university hadn't even bothered to interview the accuser and just assumed she was telling the truth. The university officials who interviewed the plaintiff didn't even read the report of the accusation ahead of time. Every single way the university officials approached the investigation assumed that the plaintiff was guilty. The university also didn't disclose any of the reports they had to the plaintiff. It was a blatant violation of his right to due process. In a scathing opinion, Judge Barrett said that students suspended from high school are provided with more procedural protections than what the plaintiff received. Most damning though, the university department investigating the plaintiff post a link to a Washington Post article on its Facebook 
the same month of the investigation. That article was entitled, Alcohol Isn't the Cause of Sexual Assault. Men are. Based on all of these things, Judge Barrett concluded that the plaintiff was discriminated against for being a man. The Keystone cops handling the university's investigation were nothing but a bunch of sexist, bungling idiots who couldn't handle working at a middle school. Part 4. Procedural Law Based on the opinions I read, Judge Barrett seems to prefer to resolve her cases procedurally when she can. She often addresses jurisdiction and standing even when the parties don't dispute these things. Now, procedural bullcrap can be a great way for a judge to get rid of annoying shit without having to deal with all the boring law stuff. However, Judge Barrett often addresses procedure even when she ends up making a ruling on the merits. Now, I'm not going to explain to you federal jurisdiction jurisdiction law. It's complicated and really fucking boring. It's not worth going into. I will tell you that standing refers to whether the proper person has brought the lawsuit. Now, let's say I posted a video with fake evidence indicating that Vosh had molested a young boy. Let's say after doing this, Vosh declined to sue me for defamation because, let's face it, Vosh is terrified of me. Instead, Xander Hall sues me. Xander Hall wouldn't have standing, and therefore his lawsuit suit would end up getting dismissed. That's because my video was about Vosh. It wasn't about Xander Hall. Now let's talk about how Judge Barrett decided this case. First, some background. Obama wanted to build some Obama center to celebrate his worthless presidency. So where do you put something like that? Well, the south side of Chicago, of course. You know, because Obama did so much to help improve the lives of urban blacks. And he's going to get the troops out of Afghanistan right? Also wrong. Well, then what the fuck that nigga gonna do? One hiccup though. Chicago is a dense urban city. It doesn't have room for some big ass Obama center. So the Obama foundation got an idea. They'll just demolish a local park and build it there. Some people had a problem with this. You know, the people who actually lived in that area. This created a legal controversy. On the one side, you have unprincipled neoliberal assholes. They're pitted up against genuine leftists trying to save an urban park. The Obama neolibs won at the trial court and the lefties appealed it. Despite neither side disputing standing, Judge Barrett found a lack of standing. The claims by the lefties were based on Illinois law. They could file them in federal court though because they also had some constitutional claims. When you file state claims in federal courts, things get really fucking weird. When it comes to the substance, the federal court has to follow Illinois law. The Illinois Supreme Court has more authority than the U.S. Supreme Court in this type of situation. Here's where it gets all confusing though. The federal courts don't have to follow Illinois procedural laws. Standing is considered a procedural law. The Illinois claims are based off an anti-corruption law. It prevents the government from just giving away public property to a private person. So under this law, Chicago can't just give Obama a park. Because it's not their property being given away though, Judge Barrett ruled that the lefties have no standing. While the Illinois anti-corruption law does give standing to people who are taxpayers, that's a purely procedural law. Federal procedural law doesn't allow this. So the neolibs win again. So the poor blacks of Chicago now have this hideous monstrosity to look forward to. But I'm sure it's not all bad, right? Well, there's going to be a museum of Obama's presidency. I can already see some of the exhibits in my mind. The top 10 drone strikes. The empty beers from that summit with the cop that Obama called a racist. Priceless works of art donated on behalf of Wall Street Bank banks, the same banks he never prosecuted for causing the mortgage crisis. Anyways, that's about as much of a preview I can give to what Amy Coney Barrett will be like as a Supreme Court Justice. If you enjoyed this video and you're not already subscribed to my channel, please support small YouTube channels like mine by subscribing. Thanks.